Thanks for the introduction. Yep. So today we're going to talk about graphs. I'll get into exactly what a graph is in a minute. But if you've ever built an audio application, the chances are that you've uh, built an audio graph, but perhaps without knowing about it. So this talk aims to give some formal definitions uh, for some of those concepts that you may have already used um, to improve your understanding so you can better utilize graphs in your own work. Um, if you have any questions during the talk, put them in the QA window. I'll address them if it's appropriate at that time. If not, um, I'll get to them at the end. So as outlined in the abstract, this talk is going to be in two parts. Uh, the first part is going to be about kind of graphs and the fundamentals, and then we'll look at some code examples later on. So first up, what is a topological graph? Well, there's a quite wordy formal definition which states it's an ordered pair of sets, VE, where the elements of V are called vertices or nodes, and E is a set of pairs called edges of elements of V. So that's quite a mouthful, but if we write this down in a couple of sets, we can see that, that we have essentially some vertices, V1, 2, and 3 here, and then a, a set of edges, which are just pairs of vertices. And if we restate that in slightly more informal language as a set of vertices or nodes together with a set of edges that connect some of the vertices, we can start to uh, understand this concept a bit more clearly. And to kind of really clarify this, we can draw these sets here. And so here we have three vertices, as I mentioned, V1, 2 and 3, and then two edges connecting them. Incidentally, if we had a, an edge connecting the bottom two vertices, the enclosed area is called a face. That's used a lot in graphics processing, but not something we're going to talk about today. So using the slightly more inform, informal um, terminology, we can change vertices to nodes and edges to connections. And this perhaps starts to approach something that's more familiar to us in audio. And if we redraw this so the nodes are actually enclosed in circles, gives us a slightly stronger pictorial um, grasp on things. So this is a graph, OK? It's some nodes with connections between them. Um, but at the moment, these connections don't have any direction to them. There's no notion of which is an input and an output. But if we add directions to these, no, uh, to these connections, we get what's called a directed graph. And now you can start to see we've built up this graph terminology. Why some of the things that you might use um, have used at school or in other work that are commonly referred to as charts are actually graphs. So if we look here at some data that's just been plot, we can see it's a graph because it's constructed of some nodes, which are our data points and some connections joining them. Similarly, if we have a mathematical function um, here, we can graph this by creating some nodes and joining them with connections. So I want to rewind now about seven months to when I started this work on graphs and this new library. And this is what my whiteboard looked like. I'm really showing this because I this really helped me kind of get to grips with how to structure these processing uh, units and also how to visualize some of the uh, slightly um, more difficult edge cases. You can see there's some with cycles and things. So I just wanted to show this because it was a really quick, rough and ready sketch, but it helped me massively. So it's always worth putting pen to paper to try and um, visualize these abstract ideas. So let's bring this back to audio now. And imagine we have a really simple directed graph here where we have two nodes, which are perhaps sound producing sources, and they're being summed together through a third node. If we extend the complexity a bit more. So now we have a third sound producing node and those first two nodes are summed together. We can start to see how this kind of mid-level graph structure relates to perhaps a, a higher level model. So we could imagine if we had like a DAW uh, session, this could be a clip. The second um, sound producing node could also be a clip. And then the third one is a clip perhaps with a clip gain attached to it. And if we add the first two clips together, they form this notion of a track. And then the, the second clip could be on a track on its own. And when we add those two tracks together, we get the main output from our DAW session. So you can start to see here how we move from these higher level models and build graphs from them. 
when it comes to processing a graph, though, the, the purpose of the node doesn't actually matter. So we can rewrite this here using just letters. And this helps us when we're trying to form an order to process these nodes in. So we've got a bunch of nodes that have formed a graph, but now we need to actually process each of the nodes. So intuitively, we can look at this graph and say, well, we need to process D, E and F before we process B and C and those before we process A, because that's the direction of the graph. But we need to formalize this so we can actually write some code for it. So the way this usually happens is called a graph traversal. Um, and we're going to use a depth first search here. Depth first search, as we'll see, means that we favor going down uh, through connections before we go across. So if we start at the root node, we can start traversing this graph by going um, down the left hand side and then adding, a, adding the node as we visit it to our order. So we've added A to our order here. And then as we go to B, we add B to our order and then D. Then we go back up down to the other node, E, add that to our order, back up to the root node and down the other branch. So um, once we've got this, we can see that it's, uh, sorry, we need to finish off the traversal. We can see that this is incorrect because A is processed first here. And we've just seen in the previous example that we can't process A first because there's a load of nodes that depend on it. And the problem here is that this is called pre-ordering. Um, what we really want is something called a post-order depth first search. So we can do this by instead of visiting the nodes the first, sorry, adding the nodes to our order the first time we visit them, we'll only add them to our order the last time we're going to visit them. So if we traverse again here from A, but go down to B, we don't add those to our order. But when we visit D, we know we're not going to visit it from any other place. So we add it to our order. And as we go back up to B again, we don't add it to our order, but we do add E because we're not going to visit it again. Now, as we go back up to B, we can add that to our order and the same for the other branch. So we will add F, C and A to our order. Now, now we've got this order, if we restructure the way we're visualizing it, we can see why this works out. So the order starts with D and then E, B, F, C, A, and the connections always point in this downwards way. And what this means is if we start at the top, process D, E, and so on, we're never gonna process a node that depends on a node that hasn't already been processed. And if we contrast this with the pre-ordering example, we can see why this is better. So in the pre-ordered example, we've got both upwards and downwards pointing arrows, and that causes problems. So that's a simple example. Imagine we have a slightly more complex example. Um, this is still a directed graph, but there's a feedback loop or what's called a cycle in graph theory in it. And if we try our traversal naively here, we can see that we enter this infinite loop. So what we need to do is break that cycle somehow. And um, we do that by remembering the state of the node as we visit it and never cross a node that we're already visiting. So if we do this, we again start at our root node A and we color that orange to indicate that it's being visited. Go through B, D, C, and then E. And now we can't traverse from E to B because it's already uh, being visited. So we'll break that connection that's shown here with the red dotted line. And now, because we um, have visited all the nodes we can, we can start creating our order as we unwind back up the stack. So now we've removed the cycle from this graph. And if we draw that in the order here, we can see it's the upwards pointing arrow that we've actually removed. So there's a couple of ways to break these cycles. This is the, the simplest approach. Um, it simply removes the connection. There's other ways of dealing with this where um, instead of B having a direct input from E, it can have an input from E's previous samples. Uh, that might be musically relevant if you want to get kind of delays and things. But for the main purpose of what I designed this for was um, for a DAW session, I just took the, the simplest approach because it avoids uh, awkward kind of delays and things in people's sessions. So 
there's another feature typically with audio that we have to think about, and that's latency. So imagine another simple graph like this, where D and E are sine wave producing nodes, but ignore B and C for the moment and imagine they just pass the signal through. If we examine the signal at the two connections feeding into A, we can see one has this uh, sine wave with an amplitude of 0.5 in this period of one, and it intersects at zero, zero. Two has the same sine wave because it's the same signal. And then three, um, we can see that because these two nodes have been added together, they've constructively interfered. And um, now we have a sine wave with the same period, uh, the same intersection of the axis, but an amplitude of one. So that's what we would expect to see when we're adding two sine sources together. But imagine C introduces some latency. That is, it delays the signal that's going through it. This is quite common in audio. It can happen for an, any number of reasons. It could be that C is implementing something like a look-ahead compressor, so it has to store up some data before it can start producing its output. Or it might be something like a large FFT, so it needs to process, uh, have a lot of samples before it can output some data. So lots of reasons this can happen. But what we get now is one remains unchanged, but the signal at two has this shift to the right by 0.25. And now what happens if we sum these two signals together, we get this kind of partial uh, interference here. They've kind of added together a bit, but not quite as we had in the previous example. We can see that the previous example here in this faint line, um, but we've kind of got a bit of a shift to the right and it doesn't quite reach our amplitude of, of one. So this might not seem too bad when we're looking at uh, simple sine waves, but if we have more complex audio, shifts like this can either cause quite nasty phase cancellations or cone filtering, things like that. Or if the latencies are quite large, they can actually end up sounding like repeated signals or actual echoes. And that is wholly undesirable usually. So we can solve this by actually changing the topology of the graph by introducing a node that all it does is delays the signal going through it to balance the latency uh, reaching A. So here we've added this F node, and that's just going to introduce the same latency that C is. So now we have this signal at one, um, which has the same phase shift that C was introducing. So we can compare that to the previous example. Of course, two hasn't changed. That's the same signal from the previous slide. But now if we examine three, we can see that we have our amplitude of one back, which was expected, and we have this consistent phase shift to the uh, to the right of 0.25. So we've uh, kind of made the signal coherent again. And of course, we can do our depth first search to figure out an order to process these nodes in. And at this point, the latency doesn't really matter because it's already been handled with that topo topo sorry, topology change. Latency does bring some problems, though, um, particularly in very high level applications. If you imagine a DAW session um, that, where, that can have a change in um, structure, perhaps you have uh, some clips on some tracks being played in a loop, and then you either add a track or a clip or a plug-in somewhere, uh, that's going to change the topology of the graph. So that means that the graph needs to be rebuilt. And if any of those nodes in the graph have latency, this effectively means that they have a history of the previous samples. So what happens if we start playing a new graph and that history isn't persisted between the two? Is there's going to be a gap or an inconsistency in playback? And that will be audible as a glitch. So that's obviously something we want to avoid. So in order to avoid these discontinuities, any history buffers will need to be persisted between the old and the new graph. And the way we usually do this is that we make sure each of the nodes can be uniquely identified, and that identifier is persisted between the old and the new graphs. That way, we can effectively do a diff, and the new graph can look at the old graph and simply copy uh, any of the history buffers through, and then that plays back as if it was the old graph and we don't get any glitches or dropouts in audio. So this brings us to a question you've probably all been wondering, and that's how do cats drink? 
So you might naively think that cats uh, would go in and kind of lap up with the top of their tongue, but you can see here, they actually do this weird kind of scooping action with the underside of their tongue. I just thought this was an interesting thing, a video captured of one of my cats, um, to kind of just break up the two sections or have a bit of a breather uh, while we move on to some code. And she didn't get her head stuck in the glass. Um, I don't know why she drinks, likes drinking from cups. She has lots of bowls, but she enjoys it. Okay, as I said, on to some code now. So Traction Graph is a new processing module based on the concepts discussed uh, here today. It replaces the internal processing of Traction Engine, and this is for two main reasons, really. Firstly, is that it fixes PDC in some of the more complex situations. This can be where you have um, multiple tracks with sends across several tracks. Um, that was a very difficult thing to get right. And the other place is where we have arbitrary graphs in our racks environment, where you can have a bunch of plugins all connected with wires between them. That was a very difficult situation to balance the latency. So this I aim to solve that completely as well. And the other thing that we wanted to do with this is improve CPU performance, because as more and more cores have hit um, computers, uh, we thought we were leaving some performance on the, on the floor. And what we've actually found is this is about 20% faster in most use cases. The, the performance depends on the complexity and structure of the graph, but that's quite a good number. You can find all the code in the Traction Engine repository. It's currently on the Traction Graph branch, but it will be in the mainline soon, and it's in the modules uh, subfolder. Eventually, this will have no dependencies. Um, at the moment, it does have a dependency on Juice, that mainly uses uh, because it uses Juice Audio and MIDI buffers, but I'm going to transition those to using Jules's new Choc library. The thing that might stay is all the unit tests use Juice for the unit testing framework and also for audio file formats and things like that. But um, that will be kind of if def if defable out, so you can use it in applications that don't depend on Juice. So. Um, also, this API is currently in flux, so I'm going to go through the code quite quickly. It won't change hugely, but some of the calls and things might change a bit. So uh, just be aware of that in case you start wanting to use it straight away. So before I started this library, I wanted to write down some aims. And I thought uh, this is just generally a good idea if you're writing a library, because it kind of gives you a reference point to check back to, to ensure that you haven't deviated too much from your original goals. And the, the first was that this should be a mid-level library. Um, and that basically means it's positioned below a high level abstraction like Traction Engine that has edits and tracks and clips and things. It sits below that, but it's not a very low level um, process in library where you're dealing perhaps with kind of individual samples. It's a, a kind of framework to build graphs with. And this means that it doesn't tie itself to a specific model. This makes it highly modular and easy to test. Um, we wanted to ensure that nodes can be processed multi-threaded, and this should scale independently of graph complexity. What this basically means is we wanted to move away from the old way multi-threading worked in Traction Engine, where um, multiple tracks were processed together, in that now any nodes that can be processed, um, and there are threads to do so, should be able to process them, because in theory that should give us the best CPU utilization. We wanted to ensure that processing can happen in any size blocks. Um, this means that if you have fast parameter changes or something like that, you can chop your blocks up very small um, to avoid aliasing. Uh, sorry, is there a hand raised somewhere? I've got Ed Davies raised his hand. OK, I'll just get back to that maybe at the end. Um, Sorry, and the other reason was in the old traction library, um, we had a problem where um, uh, buses were summed together in fixed block sizes. So if you were looping, you'd have to process all of that buffer. Um, and now things can be deadly accurate. And of course, we wanted to ensure that processing can happen in float or double. Uh, this moves away from our old paradigm where we would sum uh, tracks together in doubles, but now we're aiming for a complete 64-bit pipeline, including plug-in processing. So those were kind of like high-level uh, aims. We also wanted to ensure that there were some API goals. 
And the fundamental here was that the API should be easy to use and hard to abuse. And that basically means by getting the defaults right. Um, this essentially means that the API should be quite slim. I didn't want to make it overly complex and verbose to use. It should be kind of very targeted for its purpose. Um, in places, you'll see this in that concerns are separated. So in order to implement a node is a small amount of code. Uh, building a graph, which essentially creates dependencies between different nodes, is one task. And then the task to play it back is separate as well. So all of these things are quite highly modular. Um, there are some things that we wanted to, that some lessons that we learned from the old traction engine way of processing that I'll just highlight. They may sound a bit odd, but um, you'll kind of see why we needed to state these up front to avoid falling into the same trap. The first of these is that process calls only ever get the number of channels to fill that they report during initialization. Um, in the old engine, we had this problem where if you were, say, a file reader and you had two channels of audio, but your device was running on 32 channels, you'd get a 32 channel buffer to fill and then figuring out what to do with all those extra channels was very confusing. So now if you say I'm a two channel file reading node, um, you'll only ever get two channels to fill. And that pushes responsibility onto the graph builder to scale up those channels to whatever the device wants. Uh, similarly, we wanted to ensure that process calls always provide empty buffers so that when nodes are doing their processing, they can simply add into them. And this makes processing much simpler. Um, it means if you're summing together multiple nodes, you can simply just add into the buffers. Or if you don't want to do anything because the node doesn't have to do anything at that point, you can simply return. Uh, this moves away from an old paradigm, which was where you have kind of two ways to implement node processing, where you could process replacing or process adding. And that was just confusing. You might be thinking that, well, Clearing all these buffers all the times introduces a cost. And that's right, it does, but it's generally a quick operation. But there will be optimizations and they're going to be opt in. So if you don't want your buffers cleared because you want that performance back, you can state that up front um, and not pay that cost. And this enables an easy to use and safe API whilst not sacrificing performance. So I'm going to go over the code quite quickly because, as I said, it might change and also uh, some examples of how it's implemented are a bit more useful. Um, you have a bunch, uh, the, the main class involved is this node class. There are a bunch of methods that mainly players interact with here for initializing and processing. But when you implement a node, you have these virtual methods that we'll see in more detail later. And you also have these protected virtual methods to do your preparing and processing. So in summary, when you want to implement a node, you need to declare your dependencies. You need to uh, declare your properties, which are whether you have MIDI, the number of audio channels, whether you introduce any latency and this unique identifier that I mentioned previously for um, main copy and buffers, uh, latency buffers around. Then you need to implement initialization, prefetching and processing. So if we look at these virtual methods in a bit more detail, you'll see there's this transform call. This gives nodes a chance to change their topology. So this might be because they're balancing latency and creating a new node to do that. Or it might be that they've um, examined the, node, the graph from the root node and they're forming a connection to um, another bus or something like that. So that gets called repeatedly until you return that you haven't changed the topology at all. Um, you need to return your inputs. This is how the graph structure is formed and how it's traversed. Then you have to declare your properties, as I just mentioned, and this is a structure with the following fields. And then you also have to state when you're ready to be processed. And this is usually just when all of your inputs have been processed. At that point, the node can be processed. Um, in your protected virtual methods that you need to implement, you have this prepare call, which provides you with a sample rate and block size to initialize. And this also gives you uh, the, the root node that you might be replacing. And this is how we do this uh, introspection of the old graph to copy out those uh, history buffers. There's a prefetch call. This gets called for all nodes before any of the processing happens. This might be useful for um, setting file position, uh, file reading positions. It might be used to update mute statuses, etc. cetera. Um, so that's, you might need to implement that. You get a reference sample range here. Um, that 
essentially tells you the number of samples that are going to be processed, but it can also be used to synchronize to something like a timeline, uh, which we'll see a li little bit later on. And then you have this process call, and notice you get some audio and MIDI buffers that you need to fill and the reference sample range that they relate to. So I'll just repeat in summary, you declare your dependencies, uh, your properties, implement your initialization, uh, prefetching, and then your processing. So as I said, this is best shown in an example. So here we've got a really simple uh, sign producing node. We're going to use a Juice DSP oscillator class to produce the sign data, and we're going to store the number of channels. In our constructor, we're going to take a frequency and the number of channels uh, to use and use that to set the frequency of our oscillator. Um, when we return our properties, we're going to state that we don't have any MIDI, but we're going to return the number of channels that we have. And then that we are ready to process because we're not waiting on, on any inputs. Preparing simply means passing on the sample rate, block size, and number of channels to the oscillator. And the process call basically just passes on the destination buffer to the juice uh, oscillator to fill. So that's dead simple. Now, if we kind of go back to this graph that I showed early on, we can see now how we might build up this structure. So we have these sign nodes that are being added and multiplied. So the code to build a graph like this would look something uh, like this. You would create a vector uh, to store your nodes that are going to be your track one. Um, you push some sign nodes with your frequencies into that vector, and then you create a summing node to sum that, that vector of nodes together, and that's going to be our track one. Our track two is a sign node, but this now feeds into a gain node. And here we've just got a static gain, but of course that could be dynamic. And then once we have our two tracks, we again add those to a vector and then create a summing node to sum those together. And that's our main output. If you think that looks a bit verbose, it, it kind of is. But we have some helper methods for these common operations. So what the code actually looks like is something more like this. So you have these make node and make summing node methods. And using this kind of syntax, we've built the entire traction playback graph. Um, and it's only about 1,200 lines of code, which is not a lot when you consider the complexity the Traction Engine has. It's got file reading, uh, MIDI reading, plugins, live MIDI inputs, live audio inputs, live MIDI outputs, live audio outputs, comping, uh, warping, bussing, all of those kind of things in just 1,200 lines of graph construction and about 30 different node types. So it's quite simple to, uh, to do this stuff. Once you have a graph of nodes, you'll want to play it back. Um, this is the simplest way to do that, and it comes in two stages. There's the prepare stage where you transform your nodes, you initialize all the nodes, and then you create an order to process them in. And then your processing, you repeatedly prepare for the next block and then process. So this is the simplest node player I can uh, think of, where you have a root node and then a vector to store the ordered nodes. You simply take ownership of a node to play, um, then when we prepare this with a sample rate and block size, we end up calling this method, which will uh, transform the nodes. This just iterates over all of them, giving them a chance to transform until the topology is stabilized. Then we have a method to do our depth first search to create this uh, post ordering that we can use to process. And then we can iterate through those nodes to initialize them. And this sets internal buffers and things from the nodes. We return that to our node player. And then in the process call, we simply go over those nodes, call in prepare for next block. That resets any um, has processed state and then also passes on the, the sample range that call, gets passed through to prefetch block. Once we've done that, we can process all of the, um, all of the nodes. And then the, the main output here will be from the root node, which we can simply pass on to uh, the buffers that we've received here. So quite simple to play back a node. There are more advanced ways of playing back nodes. If you look at the library, there's this node player class. Oh, sorry, just in summary again. Um, so to, to implement that, you prepare by transforming, initializing and creating an order, and then process by preparing and processing. So there are more advanced node players in the library. Um, the node player class does most of what you'll need for something like a DAW. It contains a playhead, which can be started, start, set, loop, in and out points. Uh, it also deals with scrubbing. Uh, 
Um, it has the ability to set a new node. And also this maintains the continuity. So you can pass in the old node uh, to the new node when you prepare it. And it gives us the ability to change the sample rate and block sizes. So that was a single threaded way of processing a graph of nodes. But we also have multi-threaded players. And this effectively uses multiple threads to process nodes concurrently. This is trickier than it sounds, actually, and we'll see why in a second. But the main thing is that there are many possible algorithms and ways to do this. I'm going to show one example, which is how we've implemented it in a, in a lot free way. So imagine we have this uh, post-ordered depth first searched graph. The first thing we need to do in order to process this node in a multi-threaded way is go through and make a note of the number of inputs each node is waiting for. So D and E both have a count of zero here because they don't have any inputs, but B you'll see has two inputs, so that gets a count of two. F has a count of zero because it has no inputs. C has a count of one for one input, and A, of course, has two inputs, so that gets a count of two. So this is kind of the pre-setup. Now, once we've done that, we need a FIFO for the nodes that are ready to be processed. And then we can go through our nodes, and any that aren't waiting for inputs, so they're ready to be processed, can be added to this FIFO. So we go through here, adding D and E. B can't be added because it's waiting for two inputs but F can be added. Then um, C can't and also A can't because they're both waiting for other nodes to be processed. So now we could have some threads to process these nodes. So any number of threads really can tr could try and process this FIFO. So we've got three nodes available that can be processed. So imagine a thread comes along, processes D. D then goes to its outputs and decrements that count from whatever it was uh, by one. So this has decremented it to one. Now imagine possibly at the same time, another thread comes along and processes E, that goes to its outputs and decrements the count by one. Now, if that count gets decremented to zero, atomically, of course, then that node can now get added to the FIFO to know that it can be processed. Of course, another thread could be processing F at the same time, that goes to its outputs, decrements the count, and because that's been decremented to zero now, C gets added to the FIFO. Now imagine a thread the same way comes along, processes B, goes to B's output, decrements the count by one. Um, and at the same time, so I've left these arrows in place, a thread could be processing C, that uh, goes to its output, decrements the count by one, and now of course it can add A to the FIFO. Then that thread finishes and the thread that was processing B can finish as well. And now A can be processed. So you can see how you can have multiple threads processing nodes as they're ready and adding to this FIFO as nodes become available to process. So that's, that was one processing pass. Um, so the way this kind of works out is that normally you have a single real time audio thread that does that kind of setup stage and initial filling of the FIFO. But then as soon as nodes are added to the FIFO, you can have any number of worker threads that kind of try and process that FIFO to cooperatively help out. Of course, the audio thread can do that as well. But this raises some questions. Uh, the first is how many threads do you start? We saw um, in that example, and lots of uh, common things like DAW uses, you, you start with lots of leaf nodes that are ready to be processed. But as you kind of boil up the graph, you, you have less and less nodes available to process. So how many is the best number of threads to deal with? And there's going to be a trade off here between CPU use or essentially energy that's burned and the data that you can get through your processing call. So for a fully real time implementation, this means that the, the audio thread can't interact with any system calls. So that means no locks, no condition variables, uh, no events, et cetera. And when you have these worker threads, they effectively then continuously just spin on the FIFO waiting for nodes to be available. So if there aren't any nodes available, that's just kind of burning CPU cycles. They can use CPU pause instructions to try and um, avoid the CPU actually doing anything. Um, but you could might think, well, 
that doesn't help a huge amount. So maybe I could yield or sleep and then that would actually return that um, time for other threads to do things in the system. But that's not such a great approach because it's very hard to get those threads to then come back to do some processing at just the right time. Um, there's a good chance that you'll be halfway through another audio callback by the time the sleep or the yield returns. So that's, that's a tricky thing to get right. If your concerns are less real time, um, you could just use something like a condition variable where these worker threads wait on the condition variable and then your audio or your kind of main processing thread signals all those threads, they start up, they all cooperatively process the FIFO and then kind of go to sleep at the end of it. But as I said, that's not real time safe. So you can't do this if you want a completely real time solution. So there are lots of uses of traction graph that you can go to uh, see examples of. First is uh, in traction engine itself. There's the edit node builder files that takes an edit and builds a graph of nodes to process it. And what's interesting about this is that it completely separates the model the, the high level edit model from the processing side of things. And this provides a customization point. So users of Traction Engine could say, well, I don't need all these like perhaps live um, input features, or I don't need that bit of the graph, or perhaps I just want to implement file reading in a different way, for example. We could then have a, like a single function that you could uh, override and then say, hey, give me an edit and I'll give you back a node and then Traction Engine takes care of just playing it for you. So that's quite a cool thing that we can do. If you want a slightly kind of narrower example, have a look at the Traction Engine racks, and in particular, the Rack Node Builder class. That takes a Traction Engine rack, which we saw an image of earlier, it's essentially some arbitrarily connected plugins, and returns a node to process it. Now, once we've got that kind of uh, functionality, we can think about some future use cases. And this could be to actually build into Traction Graph itself an intermediate rack-like format where you essentially have uh, some plugins and some connections between them. And we can use that to generate um, a graph of nodes to be played back. And now you might see, well, we could take a Juice audio processor graph, which is essentially that kind of representation, convert it into this Traction Graph uh, format that it understands and generate a node to play it back. Now, not only does that give us the perfect PDC that uh, Traction Graph does from the Juice Audio Processor Graph, but um, it also gives us an ability to play that back in a multi-threaded way, which is something that Juice Audio Processor Graph doesn't give you at the moment. So in summary, uh, today we've looked at graph representations of audio. We've seen how ordering produces processable directed acyclic graphs. We've looked at common audio problems such as latency and continuity. We've seen how Traction Graph Library implements those ideas. And we've seen how this is a scalable way to process audio applications. So thanks for listening. Um, you can catch me on Twitter at DRO Audio. I'll put these slides um, probably in PDF and HTML format on my uh, DRO Audio presentations, GitHub repository, and you can find all the code in the Traction Engine repository um, on the Traction Graph branch at the moment. But as I said, that will be in the main line soon. So thanks very much. OK, so I guess I'll just run through these in order. Uh, so the first question is, can Traction Graph be used to build non... Oh, it's just a spit. Can Traction Graph be used to build nonlinear applications, kind of like scene launching in Ableton Live? Um, Traction graph in theory, yes, because it it doesn't really know anything about this higher level model. If you build some model and then generate a graph from it, it will just play it back. And if inside those nodes you have some content that has some notion of a playhead and it just loops it back, then absolutely it could be used for that. But it, it's not that level of abstraction. What you're probably asking is something more like, does Traction Engine have that notion? And at the moment, no, but it, it is one of the things that gets asked a lot. So we'll be, we'll be looking into that perhaps once Traction Graph is kind of finished and fully integrated. And at that point, you will describe your kind of clip launching in this high level Traction Engine environment and Traction Graph would just be building nodes to play it back.
Okay, so that one has been answered. So I'll go to the top here. Does each node have its own buffer? Is the block of audio copied from node to node every time? So this is one of those um, kind of get the defaults right cases. At the moment, yes. So every node has its own buffer. And for something like a DAW session, when I kind of calculated this, I realized that wasn't that much memory um, and it's quite quick to do those allocations. But now that we have this nice graph structure that we can traverse, there's lots of places that could be optimized. So if you have nodes that you know are never gonna be kind of processed at the same time, they can just have the same buffer. So you can probably half the memory usage or more doing something like that. And maybe that's something that I'll add. Um, the other thing that you can do is that when we go to, uh, when we move to Jules's chalk library, rather than um, kind of having a buffer, you could say, I don't want you to allocate me a buffer because all I'm going to do is change some channel pointers around or do something like that. Or if you have a node that only has one input, you could actually use the buffer that that has. Um, so that's going to look slightly different. It will probably be um, something like you can just pass it a buffer view instead of allocating a buffer and then uh, dealing with that. So I hope that answers the question. Basically, um, they're optimizations that will be used eventually. Uh, Ryan, thanks for the great talk. Have you considered using semaphores from the POSIX real-time standard instead of spin locks to wake up worker threads? Um, I have considered it. We currently have um, this hybrid model that we use in Traction Engine where I think I kind of briefly mentioned it. There is a condition variable that um, is used to wake up the, the nodes. And as far as I can tell, when you dig through the stack, there that's implemented in terms of like a, a Mac semaphore. That's on Mac OS. I know implementations will vary across different platforms. The reason it does that is because I didn't want to get into as low level details right in something like um, that's platform specific, but it is something that I will look at. I've got some performance tests uh, that get run quite a lot in the library. So um, there, it's very easy to change that. It's, a, it's actually a nice class that you can just say, this is how my threads are gonna um, be woken up and slept, et cetera. So you could very easily change out that signaling uh, method. And if using POSIX semaphores or something like that is much quicker, then we'll probably use it. Um, how much time have I got left? Are we at the end of the session now, or shall I carry on answering questions? Okay, I'll try and be quick because the questions are coming in quite quickly. Uh, Chris Roberts says, um, what's the library from Jules that you keep referring to? So it's called Chuck. Um, it stands for class header only something. I'm not sure, but um, if you look at Jules's GitHub or do GitHub search for Chuck, you'll see it. it's basically just some uh, really common audio classes. Like there's uh, an audio buffer, there's MIDI in there and it's completely permissive. So you can use it without any uh, kind of licensing restrictions. So Glenn says, what's the relationship between Traction Graph and other data flow uh, frameworks and languages such as Soul and similar? Um, there is no relationship at the moment. It's not implemented in terms of Soul or anything. Although I did look at Soul and the way it kind of constructs graphs um, as kind of inspiration, but they're not really exactly the same. It's a C++ library rather than a kind of a language paradigm. Um, do I understand correctly that nodes can only take audio and MIDI as inputs and that parameter changes come in via another route? If so, how does latency, latency compensated automation work in traction? Um, so yes, that's right. Um, latency compensated automation works in a kind of tricky way in that each node um, has its own playhead because it knows its latency and it knows the reference sample range. So it can figure out what time it needs to be processed at. And then that all boils out as the latency gets introduced through the graph. And then 
each of the places that automation is updated will use that node's reference of time. So they're kind of doing automation for their bit of time. I hope that kind of makes sense, but it, it basically it just works. Um, I don't fully understand how you preserve history when the graph is rebuilt. If there's a delay node with an internal buffer, how does that buffer get past the new version? So the way this is actually implemented is um, e latency buffers are shared pointers to, to audio buffers, and the new graph can look at the old graph. It can traverse it and say, oh, you're the node that I'm replacing because you have the same ID. And there's a complicated way of hashing nodes together so that you always end up with the same ID. And then it can simply take a reference to that latency buffer. And then when that graph disappears, this one starts playing back. It just uses that history buffer. Um, does the single license cover both traction graph and traction engine? Uh, at the moment, yes, but I'm not sure if they'll change at the moment, but traction engine is really reasonably priced. So uh, if you buy a license for that at the moment, you can use the version of traction graph is in there. If it does become its own thing, I'm sure it'll be uh, equally as favorable license in terms, but basically we just haven't fully decided yet. Uh, is it possible to process faster than real time with custom node player? Uh, yes, you can do that uh, processing as quick as you want. It doesn't have to be in real time. Uh, we do rendering like that. Um, would it be possible to have a node player implementation uh, feature in a playhead that supports changing the playback speed by using some time switch algorithm? Um, yes, you can play back kind of as fast as you want to. How you, uh, how nodes interpret that will vary. So you could have like file reading nodes that then play back by speeding up their data or going through some time stretching library, or you could do it at the root node and say, I want the whole thing to be stretched or, or squashed. So it is possible to do that. It's, it's kind of flexible. Um, does the user need to add the delay nodes manually or are they automatically calculated while added processing the graph order? Um, so if you use some of the library nodes like summing node, that will do the latency balancing automatically. But you don't have to use that when you're building a graph. You can just create your own nodes and patch them together. And in that situation, you'll have to handle the latency yourself. But if you use the library, it, you, it will do it for you. And I've just got one last question. I'll, I'll answer really quickly. With the multi-threaded algorithm you described, processor could be processed by different cores in each audio callback. Would that be a problem for cache loading? Um, yes. How much that matters will probably depend on what system you're running on. Um, but as I said, the way threading is handled is really up to you. There's um, a kind of customization point, a class you can provide that will do the threading. So if you want to, um, to get more complicated, you can. You know, you can write your own node player. The graph stuff is all the same, but you can write your own node player that just processes graphs. And then you could use thread affinities or make sure nodes are processed by certain threads if that helps with your cache coherency and things like that. So it's kind of it's flexible. Um, yeah, that's basically the answer to that one. So I think that's it now. Um, yeah, as I said, I'll, I'll try and jump onto floor two or maybe three if floor two's full. Um, but thanks, everyone, for listening and thanks for the great questions.